So if I sent a signal to you in another planet and you're receiving it, you don't have to build a large dish, right? You can just build a small dish. And thinking about back to panoramic study, we use you know these very small 20 inch lenses, half meter size lenses. Mm -hmm. And even if you do the calculations, you can take Earth's technology today, go a thousand light years away, take a laser, shine it back to Earth, and our little dish will detect it. That's mm. how bright lasers are. Mm. So lasers became this kind of realm in optical study as an interesting realm to look at that wavelength. And by optical, I mean visible light. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to send signals, you know in between stars there's gas and dust, right? And this is why you sure. might, you like probably will say, well, you should probably, if you're communicating mm -hmm. thousands of light years away, communicate yeah, at radio wavelengths. Radio, yeah. So, you know, we knew this as SETI scientists, right? So one of the arguments, in fact, is if you were to use a laser or use a beacon that's not at radio, maybe you would do infrared, mm -hmm. right? And this led into our team also building another kind of like the first near-infrared SETI instrument, which I was interested in early on to get to those wavelengths of light as well. But, you know, it's funny, over the years, you know, we always use this kind of anthropomorphic, <laughs> am I saying that right? <laughs> anthropomorphic mm -hmm. view of our technology and how we would do detection. Right. And if you go out in the public and you give public talks, they'll say, well, how do you know they would use a laser? Wouldn't they use something else? And they would give right. a word to something probably in science fiction. Laser, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't. But light is everywhere in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. And in truth, we're not necessarily detecting lasers. We can detect anything at visible light that would make a bright flash or look unusual to nature. And everything in SETI is about detecting something that looks unusual, mm -hmm. that you know, natural phenomenon aren't producing. And that's true at radio wavelengths as well. What are the most significant background or systematic sources of astrophysical contamination? At optical study, we really don't know yet. Hmm. Most of the things I think for our program, like panoramic study, the things that we may detect the most now are like satellites. Mm -hmm. So kind of earth technology. We detect a lot of planes, satellites, even people talked about sprites in the mm -hmm. upper atmosphere. So kind of local to us, that's true in radio study too, right? We mm -hmm. talk about radio interference yep. and most of radio study is removing our own earth signal Atmosphere. from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Astrophysically, the exciting part is we don't know. Would pulsars be something? Potentially, or? yes. Mm -hmm. One of the astrophysics things is, is we have LIGO, of course, with gravitational wave discoveries. If we have these large angles of field of view, perhaps we could correlate an event mm that may produce what we call an optical counterpart mm -hmm. to it. But, messenger. but nobody's mm -hmm. detected it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then do you have a protocol, you know, the signal comes in and they're talking with, you know, Proxima Centauri or you, you see something of interest. Do you guys have a protocol for what you would do as the PI as the, you know, what, what would you do if, if this comes in or is that not for No, it's a great question because we get this question a lot about <laughs> what we would do and people have their, you know, sneaky suspicions of right. whether we get taken away from the men in black. You know, we have candidate signals, as you know, in <coughs> experimental, you know, experiments, you have kind of false positives, as we say, that can occur from your instrument as a noise or it's a signal like a satellite. So we have protocols that do verification. So we have like whether, you know, we flag it like this is an exciting candidate or not. And then we go down and do the checklist to see if it's something internal or if it was correlated with something else. It usually is very unexciting. Mm -hmm. So we try not to call New York Times in most cases. But the question is, if there is something exciting, you know, we do have a proclamation that we would declare it on Astronomer's Telegram, you know, just like we would for any other transient source to get other facilities to follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, the, the question of, you know, the the rationale for another civilization to communicate with us. I mean, there's a famous quote from Stephen Hawking where he says, you know, basically trying to message to other civilizations is like ringing the galactic dinner bell. To serve men, it, it's a cookbook. Should we be cautious and not send out, you know, beacons that say that we're here? I mean, not that that's something you're directly involved with, but what's your what's your position on that type of messaging to extraterrestrials? Yeah, this is the concept of METI. It's a really interesting ethical conversation, right? There is a twofold question here. One is like, if you think there's a galactic civilization out there, you don't like go out in the forest and scream that I'm right here, right? That's <laughs> another phrase that's used. That's interesting. Of course, we're constantly leaking. I think more of it comes into kind of an ethical question about representing humanity. Mm. And so, as you know, there have been, you know, people with means that go out and have taken radio dishes, 
taken their fav favorite rock album and broadcasted it to space. You know, is that the best representation of humanity? Should there be kind of United Nations protocols about messaging over time? You know, there was a lot of work into the Voyager message on how to represent this and how to represent uh, planet Earth as a, in general. I think we're a little young in our infancy to send out messages, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. And the risk might outweigh the rewards. You mentioned earlier, you know, about looking for, you know, not maybe, maybe techno signatures, but maybe just bio signatures from aliens in our own solar system. So I have an argument I'd love to run by you. This is a meteorite. Now this is from, this is Chelyabinsk meteorite. I have a meteorite and I actually have a Martian meteorite that came from Mars. This is not that. This is actually yours to keep, unlike the Martian meteorite. So I'll let you take one of these. Wow. So this is a chunk of Argentinian wow. gold. It's actually iron, nickel, cobalt. So, and you too can get it out there. As you know, go to my website, briankating.com slash list or slash YouTube or slash whatever. Go to slash list. I'll actually cut out the YouTuber. So go to briankating.com slash list. And if you're like Shelly and me and you have a .edu email address, you get one guaranteed if you live in the US. So go to briankating.com slash edu and you'll get one and you'll get some information about that one. Now that one came here via gravity. Mm -hmm. I also have one that came from Mars, I said, and you know, I scanned it for life, never found any life on it. But the point I guess I'm trying to make is the fact that we don't see life on Mars. Okay, it's it's a it would be a long shot, but can we use the non-observation of maybe techno signatures in our in our own solar system? Does that set any limits on the fecundity of life in the universe, or is that too limited a scope to project into the rest of the galaxy? Well, as you know, the cosmos and our Milky Way is vast, and something that's always humbling as an astronomer is the distance between stars. Yeah. I think the only thing you could say is something about interstellar travel and the number of people taking vacations here in our solar system. <laughs> Now for Mars, I think more of it's, you know, people, we take rovers there, as you know, to look not just at like whether life exists now, I would say more of the argument is did life exist, yes. right? So if you look back 3.1 billion years ago, we know Mars had an ocean. We've done a lot of, you know, discoveries about our own surfaces of other planets within our solar system. The question is, if this gets back into the origins of life, now, if we go to Mars and a rover says, wow, look, there was evidence of life billion years ago that it could start either on another surface besides earth that's a very statistical big deal yeah. right mm -hmm. because it means not only it can just happen on one surface it can happen on another and not only that it could happen on another surface in the same solar system mm. that marvels me mm. actually the mm -hmm. most brian because the fact that we can take you know our resources today do things like launch the europa clipper and go try to study the oceans of exo, you know, exo moon discovery. I know you had David Kipping yeah. on recently. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about life underneath Europa's ocean or Enceladus' ocean, the moon around Saturn, and thinking about organic materials and what organic materials could be there. That's fascinating to me mm -hmm. that one solar system out of billions we're contemplating, not necessarily, you know, did, can life coexist just now? in our own solar system, but could it have coexisted in the past? Yes. Right? You, we started this whole podcast thinking about, you know, the probability of life. The, that, that should be a measurement, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That even in our scientific nature here in one solar system, we're exploring potential signs of previous life and other surfaces. Yes. And when they may have overlap with life on Earth, because life on Earth kicked well, off. Well, yeah, we can get to panspermia early. and other right. things. Here we go. Mm -hmm. but. Take that to all the other planets we're discovering now, James Webb Space Telescope's discovering. It's an incredibly exciting time. Mm -hmm. And when I started my career, you know, I was I was always interested in this question of are we alone? But I remember sitting in classes in undergrad and people were talking about this rare earth hypothesis. Yeah, right? Book somewhere here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, you know, even in my my little our little short little sliver of time here, we know that's not true. Right. And again, this is marching down the Drake equation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So now I want to pivot to a recent, you know, I told my wife that, you know, I saw a star being born when you were on the recent Nova, PBS Nova, which is, you know, one of the, not only one of my favorites, one of the oldest, you know, science and, and nature communications, you know, and it's one of the best and well done. And so your episode was no exceptions. Talk about the genesis of that, if you will. How did you come to get involved with, you know, PBS Nova and talk a little bit about the role that you played in the other, you know, contributors to that to that wonderful episode. So I've always been interested in studying techno signatures in this field of Are We Alone? And 
there's actually not that many people in this field, which mm -hmm. is one of my things to advocate for that we need, you know, more brilliant people entering this field of, of study and of astrobiology.